Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar series for July 22nd, 2024. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its, its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is automated building and deploy testing using Zeek as an example with uh, Michael Dopheide. Dop is a senior security engineer at ESNet and it says here on this piece of paper, we are married, is that correct? That's to tell me. Okay. So um, before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the presentation, but I will uh, change things up a little bit from our normal series. Uh, I'm going to enable your microphones at the end because if you have a highly technical question, I understand that it might be annoying to type it all out. So at, toward the end, we'll have people raising their hands and then I, I can um, enable your microphone. So if you wanna have a more technical uh, discussion, you can save it for the end. And I think that's all we have to start. Um, Dop, welcome to the Trusted CI webinar series. Yeah, thanks for having me. So um, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, thanks for, for, again, thanks for having me. Um, I started developing these slides uh, kind of a while back um, to actually talk to uh, internal ESNet staff about the, our process and kind of realized that maybe this would be useful for other people as well. Um, so mostly talking about, you know, automated building and deploy, deploy um, and I'm using Zeek as an example, but I don't actually discuss what Zeek is. So, so real briefly, um, Zeek is a, a pretty common open source tool for um, network intrusion detection, packet analysis, key packet analysis, um, originally developed here at, at uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So um, if you have more questions about Zeek, I encourage you to uh, you know, Google it, look it up, check out zeek.org, um, check out their Slack channel um, where I can, I can answer questions uh, as we get to the end too. So um, what is ESNet? Uh, and that just kind of provides some context for what I'm gonna talk about. Um, we are uh, a part of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, I'm obviously based in Illinois. Um, we are funded by the Department of Energy to provide high-speed networking for open science or in support of open science. So we connect the DOE national labs, we connect to universities, um, and we help um, you know, get all the science data where it needs to be so people can do their research. Um, we've, you know, in, in the past several years, we've connected over into Europe and discern so we can get the LHC data um, uh, and, and things of that nature. Um, and this is, the, this is the version of what we call DSNet 5 in 2016. This is my safety safety minute slide. Um, so I started developing these. I realized, especially for trusted CI, I'm giving a talk to trusted CI about trusting CI to improve the robustness of your CI, right? So that's confusing. Um, we're gonna be talking about um, continuous integration, continuous development, um, CI, CD, um, very common in the, in the, the realm of software development, um, more and more common in, in systems engineering administration. Um, and we're adopting it pretty heavily in the security field as well. Um, so, we're, but we're talking about those two things, that and cyber infrastructure, uh, but we're not talking about, you know, confidence intervals, cyber insurance, any, any of those other CIs that might be available, uh, aware of. So why CI? Um, so I showed the picture of ESNet 5. Um, oh, you know, I can't remember the year we started, probably five or six years ago, we started developing um, ESNet 6, um, a major funded project by DOE to completely rebuild the network from the ground up. You know, not just replacing routers, but um, complete rebuild. Um, we have lit dot dark fibers. So we are now managing our own optical plane as well. Um, and before that, all we had was two production Z clusters for data center traffic um, and a handful of test systems in, in various states of disarray. Um, we managed those two systems. You know, we compiled Zeek directly on the cluster nodes themselves. We installed binary packages individually, managed all those scripts, often making edits directly on the hosts. Um, it's just two systems. So it wasn't too bad to keep them in sync. Um, but then comes along ESNet 6. That's kind of the, the like I call it like the dark mode ESNet 6 slide. Um, it's basically the same footprint, um, but it, it's completely rebuilt, like I said, and we have a management network that includes um, monitoring at all of the major pop sites. So 
now um, we have additional an additional production Zeek cluster in a data center, but we also have roughly 37 standalone systems monitoring Zeek on the management network. So the, these MN Zeek hosts, um, and I should note that they also cannot reach the internet directly. Um, so they can't go out to GitHub or Zeek.org and, and download binaries, if, even if we wanted to. I can no longer obviously manage all these machines by hand. Um, it just, it, I mean, I can't remember all their names, let alone uh, log into them all and build, build Zeek. Um, and even if we used the project's pre-built binaries, um, we'd still have to build all of our own plugins. You know, if we install those as packages, that means every node has to have all the appropriate build tools and has to be kept in sync um, in that manner. So how does this work? Um, we use GitLab CI. Uh, we have an internal uh, GitLab system that, that clones the Zeek repo from GitHub. And we have Zeek deployed in, on three different OSs. Like there's a uh, Ubuntu 20, Ubuntu 22, and Rocky Linux 8, which is just a clone of CentOS 8. Um, so the first thing that happens is we create a builder container. Um, this container is you know, just a base OS container. And we saw all the dependencies needed to build Zeek, which is quite a bit, quite a bit more than just running it. And we save that container um, for, for the next step. And this next step is kind of what does the, the heavy lifting. This is where we download Zeek into this build environment, in this build container, and do all the compiling, all the different you know configure uh, parameters we need. Um, that builds Zeek and outputs uh, GitLab. What GitLab calls an artifact is just you know stored downloadable files. And that's just a, a simple uh, tar GZ format. And something to note about this installation is we don't just build it to install in user local Zeek, which we, we used to do when we were building it by hand. This is installed in user local Zeek slash versions slash hash. And that's a hash, that's the git commit hash for that particular branch. Um, so if you look at, a, I have a screenshot here of one of the systems, um, you go into a, user local Zeek versions, you see all these different these different hash values, and then a link from live to whatever the current live version of Zeek is. And you know, from live, you know, live bin is a link over to uh, the current bin. Um, the only thing that's different about that is Etsy and logs we keep as static uh, directory. So we want all the logs to be in the same place and not get all mixed up. Um, and that helps us maintain um, you know log rotation and archiving. All right, so we have this artifact now, um, we built it, but we need to actually test it, right? So we kind of start again with the base OS, build a new container and install only the dependencies necessary for Zeek to actually run. So that's gonna simulate the, you know, the hardware install environment where we want these Zeek binaries to run. And then we simply, as, as the last step, we try to execute it. You know, did, did it actually work? Does it, does it run without crashing? Um, and that gives us our full CI, uh, CR, CR pipeline. Um, when things work well, <laughs> uh, this is what it looks like. Um, it's just a bunch of green check marks, um, and we like to see that screen. It's, it's kind of funny. I see, you know, up in the top it says, you know, Michael Dapetti created this pipeline. I didn't actually do that. Um, it's just automatic. You know, uh, you know, essentially we, we set up, you know, the automated triggers, so I get credit for creating it every time it happens, even though I didn't actually do anything. So, what are common issues? Um, you know, for something like Zeek or, or any other, you know, security tool where you're building from code, um, you often have, as long as the project is being maintained, you have code depreciations. Um, if you ignore those warnings long enough, like I tend to do, uh, it will bite you. Um, so usually I'll find about find out about those depreciations when our build fails um, and I'll have to go fix those. But it, we, at least I'm doing it then and not, you know, in an emergency, right? Um, we also have failures due to recent plugin code restructuring. So Zeek itself will build fine, um, but then we go to build our plugins against it and they will fail. Um, so that's another common place. Um, any, you know, real issues that we, we feel are, you know, bugs in Zeek itself, we fed those back, we feed those back to the Zeek testing team, which I'm a member of, and those hopefully get fixed before the rest of you see them in releases. Um, I'm not a strong C++ coder by any means, um, but sometimes I am able to submit a merge request to the project directly. Um, and then you kind of get result, which the screenshot here at the bit in the end is I submitted, I was able to submit a, a merge request and then, you know, I'm eating dinner or watching a movie in the evening. And I get this text that the pipeline has been fixed. You know, and that's, that makes me really happy because 
it was hours later, I didn't do anything and, and now things are working again. So here's a, a recent example of what things look like when they fail. Um, it's, it's pretty uncommon for the builder image um, or the Zeek test image, the container images to fail. I mean, they're just simple, you know, uh, container builds. In this case, you can see that the build phase worked. Um, Zeek compiled fine, our plugins compiled fine, but it was just that simple running of Zeek that failed. And if you click on that in the, in the Gallup interface, you can kind of see what happened. Um, we just untarred Zeek, we tried to run it, and we got a site fault. Um, that's not very common, thankfully, but uh, it's something, you know, obviously we need to look in and figure out what happened. But since this is a container that you know, it's not a container I ran locally, so I don't have access to this core dump. It's it's gone. So I need to replicate the issue, and typically I will do that by trying to replicate the failure on real hardware. Part of that is because I'm not that good with containers, um, and I just like to have a real environment in front of me. But it also proves that it's not just the environment problem, right? It's not just some out of memory problem on the containers. We have a real issue. Um, in this prior example, actually seg faulted on the container as you saw, but on real hardware, it would just, the Zeek process would just hang uh, indefinitely. Um, and that ended up being a conflict between um, a custom metrics plugin we had and some telemetry stuff that they were adding into Zeek directly. Uh, if I recall, it was, they were both trying to listen on the same network port and we're not happy about it. So pros and cons of, of this part. Um, uh, it's, it's nice that we can install, you know, whatever the latest version is, or, you know, if we have to, we have all those, those uh, installed uh, commit hash versions. We can revert back to anything recently that we've installed and, and, and roll back for testing. Um, it also means we're, we're rarely making changes in production anymore. Um, so things don't get out of sync nearly as much as when I was doing it by hand. Um, and, and that's really handy. Um, when a security bug is announced, you know, we've seen if you're if you're on the Zeek mailing list, you'll you'll see like, hey, you know, we've got these updates. Um, if someone's you know has a specially crafted packet, they might cause a DDoS. Um, by the time you receive that announcement, we either already have binaries available or they're currently being built in the background, just about ready to be deployed. Um, so it saves us a bunch of time. And we're not, you know, at the time of the security bug, we're not going back and fixing all of our depreciations because we've already done that. Um, and finally, the, the biggest advantage, obviously, is, is these failure detections and bugs we find and feedback to the, the community project so that uh, other people don't have to find them in the field. Um, disadvantages, um, honestly, aside from the amount of work it took to, to build it, there aren't many. Um, the, the, these builds take up a lot of disk space, which we just solved with you know, expiring them. Um, you could store them forever if you wanted to, but we didn't feel like you know six months down the road, it's pretty unlikely we're going to, you know, try to find the binaries from some old topic branch. We don't use, we just don't need it. Um, it also has made my job a little bit interrupt driven. Um, and that's my own fault. No one told me to do it this way, but when the Zeek pipeline fails, I try to prioritize that over any other work until it's fixed. Um, because, you know, letting, letting problems build up uh, defeats the purpose, right? The whole point of this is it's ready to go at any time to deploy. Um, so I wanna make sure those bugs are fixed. And that's what this looks like at this point. We've, we've built Zeek probably six or eight times a day on average, um, all in the background. Um, and then we have this binary that's ready to install. So, so now what, you know, now what do we do with this? So now we get into kind of the CD side of things, the, the deploy testing. And we wanna make sure that the deploy part of this all works as well, right? And we deploy the latest, whatever the latest master build of Zeek is, and we deploy that to a system called test, Zeek Test One, um, and that happens every night. And I'll get an alert if it if it doesn't, if it doesn't work. Um, the production deploys, on the other hand, you know, to, to all thirty-seven you know, in Zeek nodes or the clusters, those require manual intervention to push them. So we're not going to end up in a situation where, you know, Zeek broke something and now all our, our systems are broken. Um, we, we keep that manual step in there. Um, Typically failures at the deploy stage are related to automation issues, not Zeek issues. Um, you know, it could be issues with our infrastructure, you know, issues with the Ansible uh, system we do deploy with, um, but it's rarely a Zeek problem. It is sometimes a problem with upstream dependencies though. Um, if, if you use the GOIP databases from MaxMind, I think it was probably six months ago, they changed the API on how you download them. So our automated process was 
failing to download the, the latest GUIP databases. So this deploy testing, we break up into multiple Ansible roles, which I'm going to uh, go through here one by one. First is the, the network capture role. Um, all this really does is it copies over the script, uh, we call it nix.vac to Python script over to the end systems. And it gathers a bunch of information about the, the Intel or Miracom Nix that we're using, you know, doing like LSPCI and, and looking at the proc file system. It's going to try to figure out, you know, what Nix do you have? Um, you know, what, what uh, model number are they? Um, what are the speeds they're running at? It's going to try to guess. Uh, either figure out if it can or or guess which is the active capture NIC on that system. Um, if it's Miracom, it's going to rebuild and install the driver. Um, and then in either case, it's going to build a systemd service file that configures that interface automatically every time it, it reboots. So for Intel, that's typically just a ton of each tool commands. Um, for Miracom, it's just running the load module script. And the nice thing about this role is it's completely reusable. Any service you're installing, um, whether it be for security or something else, you know, Suricata, some kind of packet capture, um, you can reuse this role to determine what your, whatever the capture NIC is for any other automation you have. Um, this is a side note for anyone still using Miracoms. Um, you probably noticed they're no longer supported by the manufacturer. So we're hoping to get rid of those um, as soon as we can. The, the second Ansel role um, we just call Zeek. That's the one that does the heavy lifting of installing Zeek. So given you know, a, a system is already running or a bare system, doesn't matter. It's going to do things like making sure the Zeek user is there, make sure all the appropriate directories exist, make sure all the dependencies are in place. And then it goes and installs Zeek from that pre-built GitLab artifact, uh, the same one we did the testing on in the container. Um, this role supports uh, both our LAN systems and our, our MNZ systems. And it accounts for differences in the OS on the target host, you know, whether it's Ubuntu or Rocky, you know, there's some tweaks and differences in how those are set up. Um, it also does things that the, the Zeek control script would normally do. Um, we currently run Zeek uh, using systemd. So it's gonna grab the network config and convert that to a local network.zeek. It's gonna build the cluster layout file that's typically done in the background for you. And it's gonna set up all of the system D files for running Zeek. Um, and there's absolutely no reason you couldn't just go use Zeek control for this still. It's, there's nothing preventing that. Um, and then finally, this role sets up some cron jobs for you know log management, um, uh, things like that. There's a couple of like uh, alert testing cron jobs in there as well. So third, we have um, Ansel role. We have actually two of them, um, the Zeek BHR, Zeek Scram. Um, these are for setting up, um, often people use Zeek for, um, you know, automated filtering of, of malicious traffic. So th these set up the Python environment and the client side modules and scripts needed to do those things. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, we're no longer using uh, the, the old BHR code most of you are probably familiar with. Um, we're now using something called Scram, um, which we, we built in-house. Um, and I realized no one knows what that is. So I've added a few slides to the very end last minute to, to cover what, what, what Scram is. Finally, the last role um, installs the Zeek scripts. Um, and this, it kind of feels a little weird, like maybe this should have gone into the other Zeek role, but there's a lot of different customization depending on where on the network this, the, the systems are. Um, you know, for instance, the management at Zeek scripts, they're, they're so specific. Um, it, they really don't see that much traffic. So you can be a lot more um, strict about what they see and build custom scripts for that. Um, the other repo, the main repo is we called ESNet Bro, which we, we still need to rename with uh, people familiar with the, the Bro to Zeek name change. Um, this is all custom scripts specific to us, things we haven't gotten around to putting into a public package. Um, it's local configuration for base scripts, um, redefinition of the variables, our notice policies, um, listening port for Prometheus and other telemetry, uh, things of that nature. It also installs any public Zeek packages that we use, things that you know, don't require any custom code on our end, um, just you know, install them one by one. And that gives you kind of the whole flow from, from uh, you know, top to bottom, you know, every night, like I said, you know, we get the, or uh, we do the deploys from the, you know, whatever is built in GitLab from any, any upstreams during the day. Um, and then eventually that gets pushed out to Ansible to the Zeek test system every night. And whenever we decide to, that gets pushed out to all our clusters. So typically 
in most cases, we're running a pretty recent version of master uh, across all of our infrastructure in production. Um, and I, as far as I know, we're the, one of the only testing sites that, that's doing that. Um, not a lot of people are, are running code quite that, that, uh, that recent. So kind of a wrap up on this deployment side. Um, it, it, it's a lot of work. Obviously, there's a lot of code that went into this, um, um, but it's it's definitely paying off. Um, you know, I actually find more time to do, you know, real security work versus maintaining infrastructure. Um, you know, if I'd be sitting here trying to deploy this in 37 systems all by hand, it, I, I wouldn't get anything else done. Um, and kind of some kind of a side benefit is, you know, our team is eight or nine people now, at least uh, engineers wise, and we no longer have to have everyone be an expert at how Zeek works in case something breaks, right? Now they can just go to Ansible, click a button, and that should fix everything. You know, 99% of the time, that's it. Um, you know, also it's not uncommon to have hardware failures. You know, we had a, a issue at one of our pops in Starlight in Chicago, where a, a, I don't know if it was a, a, a fire extinguisher or a water pipe burst and dumped water all over just our racks. Not anyone else's racks, just ours. Um, so we had to ship out a, a clone system and it's, it's plug it in, hit the, hit the deploy button, and now Zeke is running. Uh, so it's really kind of sweet. Um, as I said, you know, Zeke is we'll use it as an example here, but um, you can use this for, for pretty much any security service where you have to you know, deploy to a lot of systems. The, the automated build pipeline is pretty awesome. Um, and we're trying to build that into any new security service that we deploy. Um, and I want to give a huge thanks to, to both Vlad and Sam. Um, Vlad actually did a lot of the initial code development for this um, when he was here. And, uh, and Sam has been keeping me, uh, uh, you, can, you can sometimes teach an old dog new tricks, I guess, because Sam has been keeping me with, you know, what is the proper way of doing things, not just, you know, running Ansible command modules all the time, but actually doing the right thing. Um, so th these two guys have been a uh, huge help. So, I did mention I want to talk about Scram briefly, um, just kind of an introduction. Um, so this is just a modular tool for automating security responses. You know, think of it like your classic VHR. Um, it's web-based, so you you know you engineers can log into it and do whatever they need to do, you know, block things or whatever. Um, it takes user-defined actions based on IP ranges. Um, it's the the kind of the interesting thing about it is it's built on Docker Compose now, so it's built of multiple components. Um, it makes it easy to deploy, and they're all containerized. Um, obviously, it provides a REST API for integration with other systems. You know, so Zeek can do, uh, can initiate its blocks, um, and it's extensible. You know, it's got a custom translator modules that you can you can build them and define them for other network integrations you want to do. And and obviously, the, the black hole router part is is complete in in, uh, in production. Typical use cases, same as your VHR. Um, you know, block DDoS attacks. Um, integrate with tools to block malicious traffic. Um, block things temporarily for adjustment or review, whatever you're gonna do. Um, and as, as you get further down in some of the translator modules that we tend to, to write, you, know, you can do traffic shunting, you can do any, anything you can, you know, inject a route or something into a router, we'll be able to do with Scram. And that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, our deployment kind of looks like this. Um, we, we, we have several of them, but you can see kind of in the, inside the, the dotted lines are the different pieces of Scram. Um, that run in containers. And for us, at least, um, the, the Postgres database that keeps things in sync, that sits outside. And obviously the router sit outside too. Um, but that's a pretty cool tool. Um, you should check it out. And uh, that brings us to the end. Um, pretty quick, a lot, of, a lot of information there. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Dop. Let me grab the screen back um, and... I will uh, go over some news and updates um, to the community uh, while people are thinking of uh, questions they might want to ask you. So um, a few, just a few brief community updates. Our next webinar is August 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Our topic is JSON Web Tokens for Science, a uh, hands-on Jupyter Notebook tutorial. Our speakers are Jim Basney from NCSA and Derek Weitzel from uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. 
More information about us it can be found at trustedci.org slash webinars, or if you want to ask a question to me or suggest a topic, you can contact us at webinars at trustedci.org. A reminder that our cybersecurity summit is coming um, October 7th through 10th in Pittsburgh, PA. Uh, to learn more about the summit, um, the registration, when, when the time comes, go to trustedci.org slash summit. Registration is coming. I, I assure you it's just around the corner. We just have to uh, wrap up a few details before we send everybody off to the registration form. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing just so I can manage my screens a little bit better. Um, Dop, thank you again for uh, for presenting. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and actually pause the recording so that if people do want to ask questions, they feel comfortable doing so. So I'm just going to do that. So again, I just want to thank you, Dot, for presenting. Um, and those of you in the audience who are interested in sharing this, I will be posting a video for this later today. And with that, um, I, any last comments or, or, or thoughts you want to share, Dot? Um, no, I think that's it. Um, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm online all the time.